Hello guys, in this first module, I will be talking about prose translation or fiction translation. And in doing so, we will have to start with the fundamentals first. In this fundamental video, I will be discussing basic techniques of literary translation, which you will find will show the difference between the literary translation and general or scientific translation. And for that, I will show you a PowerPoint without further ado. And there you go. Okay, what I will be discussing here will be taken from mostly Clifford E. Landers and the book is called, as you can see here, Literary Translation, A Practical Guide. Okay, in this book, what Clifford E. Landers uh, talks about is mostly basic techniques of literary translation and not too much into uh, ideologies or, or philosophical theories of literary translation. And by using this book, hopefully I can uh, immediately give you some sense of how somebody does literary translation and eventually you can apply this in your own uh, literary translation activities or practice throughout this semester. First of all, we will have to deal with what is translation, which is basically a review of what you have learned uh, last semester. And uh, we will also talk about what is literature. Well, uh, this is also something that you have learned from Bulilis's class, uh, what literature is, so I'm not going to go deep into that. However, I will need to tell you that uh, translation, usually if uh, we talk about it in a general sense, relates to a transfer of ideas or meanings from uh, one language, which is called the source language, to another language or a target language. And uh, when people talk about translation, it's usually related to a written text, right? And uh, people also, people usually say it's interpretation if it is uh, oral. But uh, we, we don't go uh, into those areas for now. What I will want to discuss with you first of all is what is the difference between general translation and literary translation? Well, you know, uh, translation is a transfer of meaning from uh, one language to another, like I mentioned to you. However, when we talk about literary translation, it will be something else. It's true that in translation, you are transferring meaning. But in literary translation, you are not only trans uh, transferring meaning, but you transfer meaning and culture. That's what will uh, make literary translation a bit trickier than uh, general translation. As a literary translator, you are considered a career of culture because you deliver culture from one uh, area or one community to another. And when you deliver culture uh, across communities or across cultures, there are certain things you have to deal with and those things relate to adaptation. Sometimes you have to do intervention, but sometimes you even have to do some kind of changing, okay? You will have to change th certain things to make the element of culture in one, the element of one culture uh, can be presented in another culture. Okay, let's go uh, deeper in there. So what does it take to be a literary translation, a literary translator? Well, of course you have to know the theoretical backgrounds, uh, just like what I mentioned to you earlier, uh, the most fundamental theory of literary translation is that you transfer meaning and culture. You will need to know that. And if you go deeper into the field, which we will not be doing in this course, you can also talk about the relation between literary translation and ideologies. Okay, how does one ideology transfer into another culture? So that is a matter that literary translators often discuss. But for now, let it suffice, let's suffice it to say that uh, our most 
basic theory is that we deliver meaning and culture. And uh, these two alone will take up most of our time already. And the second thing that we also need is, well, we need to be someone with experience and flexibility and a sense of style and appreciation of nuance. And that's according to lenders, which you will be able to find in the module or in the, in the file that I'm attaching along with this video. Yeah, uh, you will need to have experience in your language, but you also need to be flexible when it comes to uh, meaning. You will not only have to deliver something accurately, but there will be some kind of, uh, uh, how do I say, compromise, yes, and also uh, negotiation so that what is acceptable or good in one culture can be acceptable or good in another culture when you uh, present that. And appreciation of nuance here, I'm referring to uh, tone, connotation, association, and so on. Yeah, and it might sound um, kind of abstract at this point, but it will not be abstract because you have experienced something like this. And I will remind you about that soon. And in this uh, video, I will be talking about uh, seven basic uh, what, uh, concepts that we will have to uh, remember in this course. And these are the, the fundamental concepts for us. First one is about uh, TL and SL, which is the target language and source language. And uh, later on, we will have to talk about the relationship between author, translator, and audience or reader. And there will be also a notion of fluency as opposed to transparency. There will also be concepts of targeteers and sorcerers. And later on, word by word, or culture by culture, or meaning by meaning, or thoughts by thoughts. That's our uh, concept as well in this video. And later on, there will be a notion of translation and adaptation, which I will touch upon very briefly here. And finally, we will be talking about tone and register, which are important when you translate literary works. If you translate general texts or even uh, legal texts, tone and register are important, but they are not of the utmost importance. While in literary translation, it can trump everything else. It can uh, go beyond everything else. Okay, now let's go to the source language and target language. I believe we both, uh, all of us are aware of this now. Source language is the language from which a text is going to be translated. The target language is the language to which the text is going to be translated or if we use um, normal people's language, it will be called original and translation. I prefer for one uh, original and translation because it makes more sense to me. And uh, we will be using original and translation uh, throughout this semester. Although every now and then I will just use source language or target language. And now uh, the relationship between author, translator and reader, as you will find is quite flexible in literary translation. The translator is not just a static bridge between the author and the reader. No, in literary translation, you will see that some translators go closer towards the author and some others go closer towards the readers. This is related to how a translator sees their function or the purpose of their work. If they want to uh, educate people about an original work, these translators would lean towards the author and tries to get as much from the author as possible and give it to the reader. That's for one. If they side more with 
educating if they want to educate the readers however if they want to say entertain the reader or make the reader feel something then they would side towards the readers and somewhat uh, stays away from the author it might sound abstract now but basically if an author wants to educate they will try to translate everything from the original to the readers although it might sound confusing for readers who don't want to be educated but if the translators want to entertain or give enjoyment to uh, the reader they will just translate what the reader what the translator thinks the reader will find important so not everything will be translated even they will uh, delete one sentence or another if they think that those sentences might not be relevant to the reader so that's uh, the second one academicians uh, who translate usually tend to side towards the author they want to be closer to the source language but uh, practitioners like literary translators who work for say uh, public i mean big big uh, publishers they will try to make the text easier to understand for the readers or uh, easier to be enjoyed by the readers and they will be more target language oriented and in literary translation uh, this is related to the notion of fluency and transparency the first one the translator who wants to educate who wants to get as much as possible from the the original is the one that we can associate with this notion of transparency they want to be transparent they want to show everything that the original work has but the second group which wants to side with the reader which wants to make the reader enjoy it they will just uh, lean towards fluency they will do everything to make their translation fluent and can be enjoyed by the readers so when we talk when we talk about fluency it's related to how a text will be smooth and readable in the target language but if we talk about transparency we will uh, want complete representation of everything that the text has okay although it might be overwhelming for some readers and for for these people those people who want to educate who wants to get uh, everything from the original to be delivered to the readers for them simplifying means colonizing a work they don't want to colonize the work they want the work to be presented in the original to the readers and the second one is called the resistance they resist to be fluent they resist to be simplifying they resist to make things easy if things are not easy okay yeah let's go uh, deeper now uh, this is one uh, line from uh, one paragraph from lenders which you can find there this is uh, according to lenders okay for lenders who well lenders writes books but lenders leans towards uh, leans towards the targeteers uh, lenders doesn't want to go too deep into the original and then presenting everything to the readers if it will make the readers confused here is one uh, information about what translators who follow the resistance theory will do for them avoiding or excluding elements uh, avoid exclude they will not exclude elements from the text because it will betray the text although in it will make the readers enjoy the work easier no they don't want to do that they want to be to give the original of the work all right uh this is lenders here for for lenders he resists resistance so he doesn't want to be uh 
he doesn't want to deliver all that the original has if it makes the uh, readers confused or uh, if it prevents the readers to enjoy the text easier. For him, uh, literary translation is hard enough without intentionally introducing elements of obfuscation. Obfuscation means uh, uh, confusing, things that make a uh, situation more complex. Okay, and these two groups, the groups that want to educate and the groups that want people to enjoy are also called the targeteers and the sorcerers. Targeteers are those who lean towards the readers, those who want the readers to enjoy the text so that they make the text uh, read more smoothly. While the others, the sorcerers, are those who want to preserve uh, the quality of the original and deliver every single thing that the original text might have. An extreme example of this is uh, Vladimir Nabokov, an American writer who migrated from Russia. Uh, for Nabokov, when he translates something into English from Russian, he will uh, preserve everything that the Russian text has. And it means when he translates, for, for example, Onegin's work into English, he gives a lot of footnotes to explain every single uh, possible meaning from the text. And uh, some readers will find it confusing, but those who really want to study Onegin will find it very useful because it is similar to knowing what Onegin has in mind. All right, let's go uh, there. Uh, let's go to another part. Now, the question is, are we translating word by word in literary translation? Uh, no, of course. Even in general translation, you don't translate word by word, right? You translate thought by thought. And in literary translation, you go even uh, deeper than that. You don't just translate thought by thought, but you will have to do efforts to make sure that the thought that you have here or the meaning of the author is as close as possible to what the author actually meant. And uh, by saying the meaning here, if the author is still alive, then you will have to ask the author if there is something ambiguous. Is this what you want to say as a writer? That's what somebody would ask. But if the author is already dead, then, um, well, you will have to go to interpretation of the works, you will have to go to literary appreciation, and you will have to use basically all of your literary knowledge to get the meaning of one ambiguous uh, line. And to do that, you will have to consider the entire text, not just that particular line. So uh, to know the meaning of one line, you will have to uh, consider the entire text. That's what will happen if the author is not alive anymore. Okay, now uh, let's go to, the, to one example, actually. Uh, this example shows how you will translate you know, thought by thought. Here, for example, the, the line is, well, same old, same old. It means it's the same thing over and over again. But in Indonesian, you cannot just uh, translate it and translate it as sama, sama, right? Sama saja, it can be like that. But in Indonesian, you will have to translate it to get, in order to get the tone of the original and also to get uh, what the writer means here. Here, what the writer means is probably about someone who complains that it's the same thing over and over again. So in Indonesian, what you will do is, wah, sama saja, dari dulu itu terus. Bisa, uh, it can be dari dulu itu terus, it can be sama saja, it can also be itu itu lagi, and so on. So, when you translate thought by thought, you will get more variation as well. And uh, the second sentence is 
Look at this. Gosh. You know, when somebody says, gosh, it's actually like saying God, but they don't want to say God because, you know, uh, many people believe that uh, saying God's name in vain is, is not good. So they would use something else. Now, in Indonesian, how would you translate that? Well, uh, you don't find an equivalent of that in Indonesian, but now you go to what the writer actually means. So what kind of person uh, says this and why does this person uh, say that? So you can interpret that when somebody says, gosh, it means this person is surprised, shocked, but still uh, doesn't want to use, uh, say, God. So in Indonesian, you can transfer this, you can translate this into saying, Ya ampun, or it can be um, astaga naga, or it can be astaga, and so on. Basically, there are uh, ways to say the same thing as long as you know what the uh, writer here wants to say. You cannot just say, uh, Masha Allah. It is an expression of surprise, but it's not what this person actually uh, wants to say because um, this person actually uh, avoids saying, say, God, okay? Now, uh, the next one, we can uh, see that somebody says, I don't know, I, I don't like to talk about, you know, that thing. We don't need to translate this, uh, you know, right? Because uh, if you translate that into Indonesian, it will be, awkward because we don't say you know all the time while in an english speaking culture saying you know is quite uh, ubiquitous people use you know when they are still thinking about what to say now if you translate that into indonesian you might say that uh, you know here is not really necessary to be translated you can say uh, Aku tidak ingin membicarakan itu lagi, will be okay. Or, uh, aku tidak ingin membicarakan soal itu, will be fine. You don't have to translate that because it really doesn't imply anything. Okay? Unless in Indonesian, you, will, you can find something to fill in. Okay. What do people say when they still don't know what to... Um, what to say? Maybe uh, aku tidak ingin bicara tentang apa ya? Ya itulah. It can be like that. It will be very conversational like that because the original here is conversational. All right, let's go to the next part. Now we are talking about translation and adaptation. This is an important thing in literary translation because most of the time we cannot just translate there are things in the original that will not fit well in uh, the translation, in the target. So in that situation, you will have to do some adaptation. However, uh, for our practical use later on, we will be able to apply this when it comes to translating something that is uh, going to be spoken. So something written that is going to be spoken or something spoken that is going to be written. You will need to do some adaptation. When something like that happens, you don't need to translate something like the original. If it is from a text, but it is going to be spoken, then you will have to consider whether it will be uh, possible for someone to say it without sounding too formal or too clunky. And also, uh, when we translate jokes, we need to do some kind of adaptation so that the joke that comes from one culture can still be enjoyed by people in another culture. Sometimes it can go as far as replacing the joke with a local joke, something that people can accept, people can see as a joke. And that is a very difficult thing to do because you will have to be both 
uh, well versed in the original language you know the culture of the original language and you are also needed to be very good in the target culture you need to know the culture of jokes in uh, for example indonesia and we will need to do some kind of adaptation when uh, what we translate in good spans or wordplay some people prefer to just delete a wordplay if they find it because it will not be meaningful in the target language for example uh, there is one joke that says uh, there's a pun in which somebody asks what's up and then the answer is the sky is up in english it is possible to do that but in indonesian can you say that can you say ada apa ada langit it doesn't mean anything if you need to do that you might need to change it with say ada apa ada bakso ada es teler ada es degan and so on that kind of translation or adaptation would mean more than just saying it word by word or uh, use the original pun right let's go to the last one which is tone and register register is the level of language sometimes it is formal sometimes it's informal sometimes academic and sometimes journalistic and uh, sometimes pedantic sometimes slang and so on you need to do that in this area you will need to look at the original and decide the register of the work if the work uses a formal tone for example somebody in the text talks in a formal language you will need to know that it is a formal language why is it important because later on when you translate it into indonesian you will need to use formal indonesian the second thing is about the tone you know tone is the feeling of the text sometimes it's sad humorous happy and intriguing and fun and excited and so on and uh, now i'm reminding you of your class two semesters ago or three semesters ago which is inferential reading in inferential reading you learned about the tone of a text and how do you know the tone of a text it's from the word choice from the point of view or uh, what else from the structure of the sentence and so on you will find the tone there and later on when you translate it into indonesian you need to use the pretty much same tone all right so here is what you learned in inferential reading will come in handy you will need to use that all right and later on i will give you a text to practice translation now if you have any question about this you will need to well tell me that's first and uh you are also needed you will you will need to also read the text the one from lenders that i am uh, giving you here in uh, in this post okay everyone i think that's all for now for the explanation about uh, the seven basic uh, techniques in literary translation if you have any question uh, just reply to the just just comment on the post and uh, we will discuss further i think that's all bye